I'm Ashley Hill. And I'm Desmond Jordan. And we're here with Mark Craner today in the newly built Ikes. We're just going to ask him a few questions about the changes that Mason Dining has implemented this semester. Okay. So first of all, Ikes is very lovely. It's beautiful. It, it is a gorgeous addition to the um, residential dining program and to Mason. It's a very spacious, very friendly atmosphere. I love the artwork on the walls. Color yep. scheme. Definitely. <laughs> color color scheme. scheme's a li little bit <laughs> loud uh, for me as an older person. Uh, that lime green lime is a lot. Mm, <laughs> a lot. But um, again, we had um, some students as part of the selection committee and they liked it. Uh -huh. So, nice. you know, the colors and the names of the stations were all were selected by students on the Student Food Service Committee. Oh, wow. So can you tell us what was the overall intended goal for all of the changes that occurred mm -hmm. at Mason? Several years ago, um, Mason made a decision that they wanted to improve their dining program as we continued to build housing on campus. Because mm -hmm. this year we'll have 6,600 people living on campus. When Taylor Hall opens up, it'll be 6,600 people. Six years ago, it was only 2,000 people, okay? So we've grown quite a bit in the last few years. We built South Side thinking that it was large enough to handle the volume, but as we continued to build, it wasn't. And so we looked at what's the next stage. Mm -hmm. Well, Ike's was the next piece to, um, actually we were, our goal was to build a residence dining hall in each of the neighborhoods, mm -hmm. okay? So we've got Southside in the Rappahannock neighborhood, this is in the Shenandoah neighborhood, and the next uh, location would have been up in the Aquia neighborhood and would have come with the next residence hall that they would build. That was in the um, uh, master plan of what we were doing. And this past year they made a decision to close the inn and turn that into a residence hall and we took that opportunity to take that dining space and convert it. It's about 220 seats. This is 384 here in Ikes. And we've got 575 in South Side. So what we were trying to do was get to a point that we had a dining location in each neighborhood. Um, and as we continue to grow, the inn may not be large enough to sustain that neighborhood. But again, if they put in more residence halls, we we're ready, we have authority to build another dining hall as soon as they start building more housing. Again, the master plan that we were under, our goal was to have 10,000 beds. The university's goal was to go to 10,000. Well, that's going to be a fairly large dining hall going up over there to build that many beds. So yes, it, it was a goal to get there. And in doing so, we also looked at what type of meal plan did we want? listening to university life, the school, and to students to, as part of that, uh, several years ago we did uh, surveys and focus groups as part of the master planning, and we came up with, they wanted community, they wanted to be able to fill in their neighborhood that they're a part of, okay? As we did that, this building got designed and put here to help build community as incoming freshmen because that's basically its focus. The Potomac Heights and Liberty Square folks are in apartments not required to have a meal plan because they have kitchens in there. Um, one of the things that we found as we went over the years, um, five years ago when we started this program, only about 10% of the students that lived in apartments have meal plans. Mm -hmm. Last year, 70% of them did. Mm -hmm. So we've actually, the dining program has gotten so good for them that they purchased a meal plan to eat in the dining halls, whereas before they did not. Mm -hmm. And so again, growth, we put it here, um, again, to build this, this room that we're in, is actually has a dual mission in that it can be used as a programming space um, in hours that it's not used as a dining room. It has its own entry, restrooms, and we can close it off from the dining room. 
So we're trying to utilize the space in many ways and make it as efficient as possible. So we did all that work. The Student Food Service Committee and I, over the last three years, have gone out to several schools visiting. We went to the University of New Hampshire, University of Georgia, Kennesaw State University down in Georgia, VCU, James Madison, Virginia Tech, um, visiting different schools, Mary Washington and uh, Richmond, University of Richmond were also part of that tour, looking at what their meal plans are like mm -hmm. and what did we want to have here. What well, came back that the Anytime Dining Program that we saw at University of Georgia and at um, University of New Hampshire met the needs that they felt were important, which those dining halls all close at midnight. We had been working till 4 a.m. with Ike's in the past and then Pilot House. We're going, okay, 4 a.m. We were having some issues with uh, the employees and the difference between 4 a.m. and 7 a.m. gets them on public transportation. So the value of that was minimal in cost in that time frame, but also made it so it's better for them. So that was a combination to just say 24 hours. But we also looked, how can we balance it? And because as an auxiliary, the only place we get funding is from you, the students. So when we sat in front of, with the student committee and we were looking at costs, we laid out, this is what it's gonna to cost to do the three buildings. How much do we need for the meal plan to be 24 hours? what's going to happen on the weekends and choosing and quite honestly balancing when the inn came into the mix it needs to be open on weekends so we needed another location open on weekends but well, we know the freshmen from what we've studied in the past tend to stay more often than an upper class students they have things that they're doing jobs whatever and that's why this was decided to be open versus the other locations. And it's pure cost because yes, I could have opened Southside, held all three open, mm -hmm. and probably would have cost you another $100 a semester in your meal plans. Mm -hmm. um, student Food Service Committee said, no, that's all right. We don't want to pay any more because quite honestly, it's inefficient. The numbers in the past few years dictate that I only really need one dining hall open on the weekends because our population goes down. As you can tell even from right now, there's not a whole lot of people in the building and we can survive with just that number. One building, uh, and in the past, these students have had to walk the south side. Mm -hmm. And so one place or another has always been open. Ike's was the only place that was open late at night. So everybody had to walk from uh, across campus to get here. So it's not like we haven't had this situation before, it's just where. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to match it up with the largest number of people that we could do the population with and keep the cost as low to you as possible. Okay? It's a balancing act. And we will be watching mm -hmm. and working with the student uh, food Service Committee. Mm -hmm. This year the Food Service Committee is, uh, they rewrote their um, charter. Mm -hmm. Resident Student Association has seats on it. Student government has seats on it, as do uh, off-campus students. And again, it meets on a weekly basis to talk about issues. Okay. And again, it's through them that we've done what we've done. Mm -hmm. We have been very active with them since I arrived here six years ago mm -hmm. to make it so that the dining program is better and better every year. Okay, okay? so you said that um, once upon a time there used to be only one dining hall open on the weekends? Yes. Yes. So the past three years I know many juniors, many seniors that have had the option of two dining options on the weekends each mm -hmm. night. Why did you decide couple years ago to change from one dining hall to two? 
we looked at what it what what was happening in that time frame and the mm -hmm. numbers that were attending both of those units mm -hmm. and found that the numbers did not support having two open mm -hmm. and to continue that cost versus closing and having one which we had had in the past mm -hmm. and it did work financially we were looking again how do we save money mm -hmm. control the cost of dining mm -hmm. and still provide a service and so that's what the why we made the decision to do what we did okay because at the moment Monday through Friday mm -hmm. there are three locations open 24 hours on campus yes Starbucks uh, and Ike's and then Pilot House takes care of the overnight for the Rappahannock neighborhood so there are three locations open 24 hours on this campus when the students are here and so yes on the weekend when the population goes down dramatically mm -hmm. keeping those dining halls open overnight was inefficient cost-wise mm -hmm. and again working with the student committee looking at is it that much of an inconvenience to walk down here which they used to do mm -hmm. versus any other and who's going to get inconvenienced to save that money mm -hmm. and it was selected that this would be the location on weekends because they tend to stay here more so that was the decision making process may i ask how dramatic are the fluctuations in the student population on the campus between the weekends and the weekdays i'd say the weekends drop about 60 percent okay i don't have the exact number and again we haven't had a weekend yet that would count this weekend coming up doesn't count either because it's a three day yes absolutely. so it's going to be a two but if i look at last year on the weekends mm -hmm. you know we've got that history and we were watching that mm -hmm. and watching Southside's history in particular again as we were looking pilot house uh, was mm -hmm. that side and i can't say last year per se because of the construction that was going on here mm -hmm. but if you go back two years we watched the numbers and that's where we were basing our opinion on okay yeah, um, Ashley and I are aware that um, Mason Dining will be observing or monitoring the, the foot traffic here in Ike's yeah. in the next few weekends how will you be uh, um, how, how likely is it that changes will be further changes will be made depending on the monitoring that well, you'll be doing? it's going to get a little bit unusual because not this weekend with the holiday but the weekend of the fifth and sixth the sixth and seventh um, we actually have to shut this building down so that the contractors can come back in and finish some of the work that they have to do where they have to shut the power off to the building they have to shut the water off to the building um, so we needed to give them two days and so we picked a weekend they're going to work uh, over the weekend and do that we're going to shift things to Southside Pilot House for that weekend. So it's going to take us mm, till the third or fourth week of September to see. And we, believe me, we watch traffic all the time. Mm -hmm. And so we're always evaluating. And again, if you talk to the food service, Storm Paglia is the chair of that for the student government. They'll tell you that we listen, we watch, we're talking to them constantly about what's going on. Um, and if there needs to be switches and we're not afraid to switch and we pick this from the information that we have you know the, do we always hit right no um, I'll use the freshens and C store there is no way we anticipated the crowds none that the old freshens never did that volume mm -hmm. but it is now so yes we hit a home run we knew it was going to be okay mm -hmm but we did better than we thought absolutely freshens mm -hmm. is yeah. delicious the lines are always oh, yeah. long people are coming in and so we've got to work those out mm -hmm. and we are so yeah we we do things just as next week we open up another starbucks mm -hmm. well the net effect is when you open something and you do something different mm -hmm. it changes something else mm -hmm. so you always have to react to that Along the lines of meeting expectations and the projected amount of people that come in and traffic, did Ike's grand opening meet any of your expectations? It has met our expectations. Mm -hmm. We kind of thought, 
at lunch that it would be a little quieter, mm -hmm. south side would be busier, uh -huh. and then they'd move, because they're up in class, and as they can come back to their neighborhood for dinner, this would be busy. Mm -hmm. And it's happening, we've seen it every day this week, and the overnight down here is averaging about 400, 450 people a night, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, so we're getting more people here in the overnight than we are at Pilot House at this point. Last year, what was your percentage of weekly income at Pilot House versus the weekends? Did you say Ooh, that? Ooh, um, you, you got to remember, Pilot House last year was a retail location, mm -hmm. and we've converted it to a meal plan location. Yes. Um, it's strictly what, last year. It's strictly what percentage came? What percentage of your income came from the weekday versus the weekend? Mm. Was it more of, of the weekend? No, it's weekdays. Weekdays. Weekend, we can define weekend as a Thursday. Friday, uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Most of the Mason classes run from Monday to Thursday. So we can designate yeah. weekends on Thursday night until about like Sunday yeah. afternoon. Then, okay. And I would not have that information because I classify a weekend Friday and Saturday night in particular. Okay, then we can do it um, as Friday night in particular. Because when you looked at it, on the weekends, 95% of the sales came from meal plans. Mm -hmm. um, again, Friday, Saturday night was meal plan money mm -hmm. um, in the equivalencies. And during the week, it still was about 95% equivalencies. Mm -hmm. So that's where the money was coming from. The volume was a little bit higher during the week, but on the weekend it dropped dramatically. Okay, it was always quieter. Sunday during night. During the nights? especially during the nights yeah. yeah unless there was an event going on in the JC that ended at 1 in the morning mm -hmm. then they yeah they got slammed because there was an event and you're taking this information from the amount of income that you earned during the weekends because I remember whenever we went to pilot house the lines would wrap around yeah. Friday and Saturday night whereas if you go on a Wednesday night no one would be there yeah I'm not saying that Wednesday night wasn't a non busy mm -hmm. but when I looked at the counts on the nights mm -hmm. Yeah, Friday and Saturday night got a peak at a certain hour mm -hmm. when the bars closed. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. but not the rest of the night. Okay. So there was there's peaks and valleys in a night uh, between three and four, mm -hmm. almost nobody. That brings me to my next question. Um, you did mention that one of the peak hours for Pilot House was when the bars closed. Inevitably, a fair amount of st students on campus are going to engage in particular activities that involve alcohol and other substances, particularly on Friday and Saturday night. From simple observations from on-campus students, Pilot House and Southside clearly served as safe environments for students who choose to participate in these activities. With there only being one dining hall open, and it also being on the opposite side of campus from where the majority of the students who engage in the activities are, would Mason Dining feel any responsibility if the worst were to happen and if someone were to get hurt or to get in trouble? We're open. Um, this location's here. It's on campus. It's walkable. It's five, ten minutes max from any location on campus. So do I feel responsible? We are doing nothing different today than we did two years ago, okay? So responsibility, I think, is not an accurate depiction of that because this circle out here was a favorite drop-off point for students mm -hmm. uh, coming back from off-campus events. And so we're right here at the circle when the safe rides brought people back. So no, I don't see that as an issue because we're right here at the circle and we're walking distance to the campus, which is safer than driving, okay? And again, they utilize this location in years past. It's, yes, it's a change, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's that dramatic of a change. And, but it is a change. Okay. While staying on the topic of Pilot House, the students really did prize the menu items, um, the old menu items, I would say, that they offered, such as macaroni and cheese wedges, mozzarella moons. What made 
um, the change, like what caused the change to be breakfast items now for Pelicans. As we looked at the locations, again, if you look at the menus being served at the three uh, locations, okay, we are, do not have identical menus in any of the locations. This location um, has a different pizza operation than Southside. If you were to go to the Globe, it has halal meats and specializes more in the uh, Pan-Asian menus. And if you go to Southside, they'll have a different vegan vegetarian and they deal more with the allergies. So each unit has specialties and w as we were looking, this location has the pizza and burgers and fries at night, mm -hmm. and that location has um, the breakfast. Again, trying to make it so that we have differences on campus so people have those choices and can get to a location that has it because in the next few months, the Starbucks will start serving sandwiches. Their sandwich line will come in there. Again, you'll see the sandwich line when we open up next Tuesday in JC, that the other location of Starbucks will have that. So you'll have three different types of places to go to at night and choosing which one do you want, but it's giving you those choices. And yes, there are menu items. Dee Dee works, the manager that works the overnight, she listens. Last year, as you know, students said, hey, we missed this. Things came back, and it's the same conversation that will happen this year. She listens, she adapts, and brings things back, makes changes. It's what, they, what she does. She's a fabulous manager. She's done the overnight for years on campus. She comes to work at 10 o'clock at night and works till eight in the morning, okay? She has done this, well, I've been here seven years, approximately, she's done it all that time. So she's worked with you, the students, in the overnight, okay? We are all students. Mm -hmm. Some students who choose to use the freedom mm -hmm. in the Mason Dining meal plan options, they are forced to pay more than the same amount as other students if they're on a block that you would value only at seven dollars why are students who choose freedom forced to pay two plus more dollars than other students you're mixing apples and oranges in your description when they come here the cost is ten dollars and fifteen cents they yes. have a dollar for dollar program yes. so a cash customer coming here pays ten dollars and fifteen cents a freedom is a dollar for dollar cash. Yes. They pay ten dollars and fifteen cents. There is no. They chose to go that direction, so they would have the freedom to choose where they eat, mm -hmm. when they want to eat, and that's why they pay those prices. But if you choose mm -hmm. a block or a fixed meal plan, you get a different price point. Mm -hmm. Okay, because you've made a decision to choose that and we offer that to try and encourage you there. Mm -hmm. So the prices are slightly different for different meal plans. But when it's a dollar for dollar, mm -hmm. we anticipate you spending most of your money in retail, mm -hmm. which needs to be a dollar for dollar mm -hmm. because we're paying those brands what they um, charge. And so when you come into this facility, mm -hmm. yes, there's a difference. To sort of backtrack to like the topic of money and pricing, do you feel that the Iris camera was a wise investment on Mason and Dining's part? I do because in the long run, um, again, opening week, people getting accustomed to it, but if you were to stand out there tonight at uh, dinner rush, people that are getting accustomed to it are just bending over, they've gotten the distance uh, down and that, that line moves through quicker. Mm -hmm. They will get through. Nobody's touched their card. They're not handing it to anybody to pass things. They're not touching anything. They're looking at a mirror. So if we can get that so they're moving through faster, not touching things, not passing things from one person to another, mm -hmm. I think that's a positive. Um, and those that don't wish to do it don't have to, mm -hmm. okay? They can use the card. And, but they'll be going through, in Ike's and Southside, there's two registers. One's going to be for the iris mm -hmm. and one's for the card. So if you don't wish to do iris, you can do the card on the other side. Do you foresee any turnaround with a complete iris camera for the future or will it be up to the students? To it's up to the student. Um, 
you know, we always knew uh, Georgia Southern University converted a year ago to the IRIS. And again, we looked at best practices to do both, you know, as we went. Best practice if you do any time dining is to have a biometric. So we looked at all the different ones, fingerprints, handprints, uh, facial recognition, retina scanning, and came back to the iris being the least invasive, okay? Because mm -hmm. it takes a photo of the iris and converts it to a number. So we store nothing but a number mm -hmm. in the system. And so when you look at it again, I wear glasses, the, they're also progressives. I registered without the glasses, and then I darkened them, and it, uh, then had it recognize me with dark glasses on. So again, you don't have to take your glasses off, you don't have to do anything, you got colored contacts, it's not gonna change anything because it's not looking at color. It's looking at points on your iris, and it's converting those to a number. And because it, I don't know what those points are, and I don't know the algorithm, I could never take that number and reconvert it to your eye, <laughs> because it's proprietary. And the difference between the, uh, peop the fear was that it was scanning the retina, minority report, it has nothing to do with that. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a photo, okay? Uh, it's no different than if I were to take a photo from this distance. Mm -hmm. Your eye doesn't change any at all because of it. Uh, it's like you stepping uh, outside from this room into the sunshine. Um, that's how it's been, how the uh, research looks at it. Okay, your eye is not affected by it. And that's what we looked for when we did it. The readers, it's a scanner, it's $1,500. Mm -hmm. um, the box, the side swiping it is about the same expense, so it's, it's an input device. Um, is it that much more? It is in speed. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's going to be faster for the students to get through and less intrusive. What was the estimated amount of fraud that justified buying these cameras? I can't give you a number on that. Mm -hmm. We know that on weekends there was. Mm -hmm. um, and On weekends there was more fraud during than the weekdays? Week, than weekdays. Because you go home, mm -hmm. your roommate's here, mm -hmm. Just hand over your card and let the, a friend from the roommate or the roommate use the card for the weekend. And the cashiers were so accustomed to just swiping and not looking at the pictures, which you'll notice that they will start watching the pictures more closely. Because any time dining requires that, mm -hmm. that we know who that person is because it's unlimited. Mm -hmm. So we do need to pay more attention to it so the fraud's not there. Okay. But it, it was it there? Yes, it's been there. Mm -hmm. We've had people climb the tower at Southside to get in free. <laughs> um, when it was Chow Hall years ago, they came through windows, <laughs> you name it. Um, students are very good at finding gaps in systems mm -hmm. and taking advantage of them. Mm -hmm. And we're always trying to find those gaps mm -hmm. and close them. Yes. Okay? Especially on the weekends. Especially on the weekends. And so that's part of what we do. Because, again, we could let it go, but then we have to raise your prices because mm -hmm. you're paying for it. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yes. Because our goal is not to have a lot of money charged to you, but let's make it as basic as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay? That's our, because as an auxiliary, we receive no state funding for these dining halls. The utilities that are in here, the staff that works. It's all paid for by you. And so we try and manage it to the best, to give you the best service mm -hmm. at the least cost. And we do have to balance that. Like you were saying, yeah, I could have all three dining halls open, mm -hmm. but a dining hall costs about $10,000 a day in labor to run, mm -hmm. and to pay the staff. You get 16 weekends, 32 days at 10,000, and we'd have to divide that by uh, 5,000 students mm -hmm. to get that so it, it could be open. That's how it would work because it, there's n we're not getting the money from anywhere else other mm -hmm. than you. There have been several points made that during the weekends you said that traffic is decreased greatly. Has there ever been the notion to cut the staff that works on the weekend and the amount of food that is made on the weekends? If we, 
if you were the student and you came in on the weekend and I closed half these stations, mm -hmm. um, and it used to be that way, we would do that. Mm -hmm. well, we found in conversation with the students and the surveys, they don't like it. So it's easier just to close the entire building. Yeah, and close the stations because the base labor mm -hmm. to run the dish room, to cook and prepare, doesn't change a whole lot mm -hmm. by, the, you know, maybe one or two people, but you still have your base labor coming mm -hmm. in because you don't change the number of people that are washing your dishes, cleaning the floors, mm -hmm. and doing all the base work or preparing the food in the back. Mm -hmm. Preparation's still the same. Uh, it doesn't vary enough to make a difference in cost. Mm -hmm. So the value isn't there. So yes, it's been looked at. Mm -hmm. we, and it was quality of service. Can I open this building full and service the neighborhood full to give best value to the people that are coming? And that's what the decision that was made. Uh, again, Food Service Committee will tell me if I'm wrong too. Mm -hmm. And we'll constantly look at it and we'll look at it for the rest of this year and we'll look mm -hmm. at it for next year. Because the pricing comes up, we have to go to the Board of Visitors in probably March with the prices so we have to have our numbers and everything just all decisions made by January mm -hmm. in fact we're already looking at the calendar feeding calendar for next year how many days do we feed in a semester mm -hmm. and typically there's 218 days next year there's 220 mm -hmm. and you know every day costs fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars uh, to operate so uh, <clears throat> that's what we look at and for clarification you mentioned earlier that there will be a two-day period in which Ike's will be closed for the contractors coming. Yeah. will there be um, say Southside or Pilot yes. House make up for the yeah. 24 we're, we're going to open somebody else the same hours okay. elsewhere on campus um, the we just found that out today mm -hmm. so the, the people are planning to um, will have advertisements up on Tuesday when people come back. And this is okay. for the weekend of September 6th? Oh, yeah, six, yeah six. What, whatever next weekend is. Okay. Going online to the budget books on the mm -hmm. George Mason University's website, they provided the budgets for 2014, 2015, and all of the past budgets. Looking at the 2014 uh, budget under the food service section, the independent operations cost twelve million dollars and forty-seven thousand. Mm -hmm. Whereas this year it'll cost twelve million dollars, five hundred eighty-one thousand two hundred dollars. Where is the extra five hundred thousand dollars expected to originate from? That's the, the amount of money that will be collected for meal plans. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this year we're anticipating more people purchasing meal plans. Mm -hmm. And right now we're not quite on target because mm -hmm. um, Taylor Hall and um, the into numbers didn't quite make the numbers that we anticipated for the fall. We're about a half million dollars behind in budget. Mm -hmm. But that's just the meal plan sales. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what that number is. So on Friday nights and Saturday nights, Ike's is the only dining hall option open to students after yes. 9 p.m. During the winter, when it's snowing, when uh, the weather isn't particularly favorable, will there be dining options open to students that may, the majority hmm. live on the other side of campus? Will another hmm. dining option be open to them? And the answer is no. No. Because think about these students that lived in President's Park mm -hmm. had to walk over there to Southside mm -hmm. for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm and that hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. They walk through that inclement weather. Mm -hmm. And so at this point, the answer would be no. no. As we grow and if the students say, Mark will pay for it, mm -hmm. we'll put it on there. Mm -hmm. But they have to say they'll pay the extra money. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's what it comes down to is we provide the service, but we have to go to the Board of Visitors to get that approved and mm -hmm. they've got to hear from the students that they want it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because we heard from the students that this is what they wanted, mm -hmm. and the Board of Visitors approved it. Okay. And we realized the um, importance of the relationship Mason Dining has with students and vice versa. So, like in the past, and um, 
and definitely in the future, how do you plan to reach out to students, um, hear like the student voice, um, since you hear like, a lot of the um, like aftermath now since the, the changes have been made? Well, again, student committee is our biggest, and again, that's why we developed it to have the residential students have a voice on the committee, mm -hmm. and to have the student government and the off-campus students have voices, because we have many different constituents. We also have a faculty food service committee and a staff food service committee. Mm -hmm. So we listen from those channels. We will be doing a survey in first of November or so. We do it every year and we listen to that. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, and plus when students, again, you've got the representatives in student government. Mm -hmm. We listen to them and they, um, they do tell us what you think. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's not like we don't. Um, we have offered to go into the residence halls and talk with any floor mm -hmm. as a RA program if they want. Mm -hmm. Not a problem. We go listen because we want to make it better. Have you heard at the beginning of the semester, even before the semester started, about the RA training when a representative came in and did you hear any of the things that the RA said in response to these changes? We heard some comments from RAs mm -hmm. that were inaccurate and that we did talk with them about the changes and the like, but changes of closing Southside or Pilot House weren't part of those conversations that mm -hmm. I am aware of, mm -hmm. but it was um, they thought we were doing some other things. Uh, they were afraid of the retinal scans, and so we worked on those, mm -hmm. and that's what we worked on. Have you taken into account, other than just student government, any of the feedback that students have been given Mason Dining via Twitter, via YouTube, mm -hmm. Facebook? Mm -hmm. Are you taking any of that account? Um, we look at them, mm -hmm. and we take it to the Food Service Committee, mm -hmm. and we talk to them about it. Mm -hmm. We always have. Um, it's always a conversation mm -hmm. because they need to tell us in working with them what we want to do next mm -hmm. because they look at what we're doing and say what are the positives what are the negatives what's going to happen and so they are a sounding board mm -hmm. they are our advisory board mm -hmm. on what we're going to do next so yes, do we see them? Do we know them? It'll be at the first meeting, we'll have that conversation. We all know that um, students you know, talk and the word travels around, which is, might be why you say that there are some like, inaccurate statements made by mm -hmm. um, resident advisors and you know, rumors, I can imagine. Rumors, uh, uphill rumors, have, so. yeah, it's uphill mm -hmm. because again, um, watching your YouTube, mm -hmm. you said, did you know Southside's closing? Mm, that's not the whole story. Oh, no, I, I did. I will quote myself. Did you know that Southside is closed on the weekends now? But also led to that and didn't say that Ike's was open. Mm -hmm. So you didn't quite fill out that there was no build up. Did you know these are the options that you have for the weekend? Before the but video if you asked us, yes. yeah, but it wasn't on the video to help people understand the whole picture. So if I watch that video, mm -hmm. it cuts that part out and doesn't tell the whole story. We made sure that everyone we interviewed was fully informed about mm -hmm. all the dining options. It's Everything that we stated at the beginning of the video was explicitly what we said to each person before we interviewed them. We'd like to have our people who we interviewed to be fully informed. Okay. I didn't see one Ike's person on that video. I saw a lot of people on the south side side, mm -hmm. but none on this side. For freshmen? Yeah. Yeah, we did have freshmen who lived in President's Park. Okay. I'll have to relook at it. I may okay. have missed that. Yeah, that would be good um, if you could. But again, we look at it, we listen, mm -hmm. and we will bring it up with the Food Service Committee. Okay? And then, um, just uh, on the topic of like the rumors that you have to constantly expel, uh, we do have um, rumor, rum rumor in particular that has be been creating a buzz, and um, Ashley has it here. Um, yes, uh, we have contracted from multiple sources 
that there have been rumors that some of these changes were specifically intended to push upperclassmen away from living on campus. Absolutely Can you not. Confirm or deny? No. 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 Our goal is, as I mentioned, we have improved our dining program over the years. That 70% of the students that don't are live on campus that are not required to have a meal plan take a meal plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was from 10% to 70%. We've done something to attract those people to eat with us because mm -hmm. they have a full kitchen, and they yet they buy a meal plan. So am I trying to chase them away? No, I'm actually actively trying to get them to be a participant because I think there's 10% more that might buy a meal plan. I think that group is there and so yes I want them as my customer here because the more customers we have the less it costs each of you if I increase the number of people that are on a meal plan. Mm -hmm. I can keep those costs down by increasing the volume because again the more people but I also need to be careful that I don't oversell and that there are no seats available. Mm -hmm. Because at the first week of school, before anybody settles in their study pattern, their workout patterns, their work patterns, mm -hmm. we do get certain peak points where we don't, we get hit and it's very, very busy. Right. But come next week, as they filter that out, no. But am I trying to chase students off? <laughs> no. I happen to like keeping them on <laughs> um, and I like having a variety of students mm -hmm. okay because if I can get an upper class in the same space as a, um, a sophomore and so forth again building that community is key mm -hmm. we want that because as you build that community mm -hmm. it's not just this year it's long term mm -hmm. okay it's what friendships can I build today or mm -hmm. Again, take those barriers away with Anytime Dining, that long-term become friendships that last you a lifetime. Mm -hmm. I'll use the example of my own son. I was at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater as the auxiliaries director, same type position as I have here, and changed their meal plans. And my son could live at home with me and not live on campus, but I told him I wouldn't pay for anything. Live on campus, take a meal plan, I'll pay for all that. Mm -hmm. Okay, he did that. He got married a few years ago, been out of school for a few years. Everybody in the wedding were his roommates from the residence halls. The friendships had stayed and they still are there today mm -hmm. after 15 years. There is something about coming, but we had created the meal plan to do the same type of thing, to open it up a little bit more for him and have the late night dining. Um, we were one of the first to do late night dining there. The board there said, you can't do it unless you make it an option. Well, 90% of the students took the late night option. So mm -hmm. it just got rolled into the meal plan after that because they said they wanted it. They wanted to eat till two, but nobody thought they would. Mm -hmm. When I got here, it was open till four. Mm -hmm. Nobody thought, you know, that was viable, but after three o'clock, it actually quiets down. But if you go to the Starbucks at four in the morning, they still need three people working to take care of the business because mm -hmm. it's busy. We still have that value of that there is activity. And you look around us, you get the Wendy's now, the McDonald's, they're open 24 hours across the street. Mm -hmm. The Denny's is the next closest. Mm -hmm. So we're fi filling a need on campus at a lot of other campuses, students pin two to three hundred dollars a semester going off campus to find food. Mm -hmm. Now it's part of their meal plan, they don't have to add on to that. Mm -hmm. So there is a value, anytime dining, 24 hours, you do not have to buy pizza, you can come have this pizza. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a savings to students. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not coming out of their pocket to buy those things. And it's, the average is about three hundred dollars a semester for off-campus food at night. The order in the pizzas and the uh, Chinese foods, and we've taken that and built it into your meal plan. Mm -hmm. So it's safe to say that the rumors had complete falsehood. Complete right? falsehood. Yeah. Uh, I don't need anybody leaving. <laughs> right. Exactly. I need all the customers I have mm -hmm. because if I chase off the upperclassmen, who's going to fill in behind them? Absolutely. Okay. I don't need to do that, but I've given, I've got a lot of options for those upperclassmen. Mm -hmm. 
you know, count the number of meal plans that we offer mm -hmm. for the upperclassmen in particular. We will grow out of that, mm -hmm. but um, it's a changing mm -hmm. that we're doing. We didn't cut it off and said you don't get those anymore. It's a gradual cutoff mm -hmm. so that as you graduate, yes. you won't have it. Yes, you know? I actually did hear that possibly, I'm a sophomore currently, okay. that I would be one of the last upperclassmen with mm -hmm. the meal plan option. Yeah. Um, next year, when you become a senior, mm -hmm. Odds are you're not going to live in a residence hall without, you'll be in Potomac or one of the apartments if mm -hmm. you stay on campus. So you won't be required to have a meal plan. That's mm -hmm. when the change will happen. Mm -hmm. That those will slowly go away, but you'll have the option, optional meal plans if you wish to have them. Okay? And again, we'll continue to change in the summer of um, 16. Mm -hmm. The east side of the dining, uh, Johnson Center will go through a complete renovation. So the Burger King space, the sub connection, all that will be gutted out that summer and all new restaurants come in. Mm -hmm. Whether or not it's Burger King, those haven't been decided. That's part of the food service committee decision making process. Over the next 18 months, we have to determine who that's going to be. We've negotiated with Chipotle to try and take space. Whether or not they do, still up to them. Because mm -hmm. that's up to them to choose to come to campus. Mm -hmm. Not Mark, not Sodexo, that company will choose. Mm -hmm. And at this point, they've said no. Mm -hmm. That's their loss. Mm -hmm. um, we've got Panera Bread coming on this uh, in November. Mm -hmm. They'll open up. Though that was 18 months worth of negotiation to get them. Wow. We were in negotiations with Aubon Pan or Panera. But the students selected Panera as their number one choice. Mm -hmm. Chipotle was number two, okay? And we have Panera coming in. Wow. So did we listen to the students? Yeah, we did. Um, we work, work it real hard. When you tell us something, mm -hmm. we're working to see if we can make that work within the dollars that we have available. Mm -hmm. Do you see any changes in the near future regarding the opinions of students about the changes that you implemented this semester? We were listening to the committee. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, and they're pulling the information from what you have out there, mm -hmm. um, as do we, and we'll talk, talk it through with them. So does the opinion count? You bet it does. Mm -hmm. If you look back at what we've done over the past few years, mm -hmm. it is student input that has driven us to where we are today. Mm -hmm. So I believe we have listened to the students, and we will continue to listen to the students. That is wonderful, absolutely, because um, the students are the ones who are supplying the money. You're, so. you're, that's right. So why would I give you something you don't want? <laughs> okay? But I also have to balance it mm -hmm. because you have to pay for it, mm -hmm. and I don't want to make it too expensive mm -hmm. that you don't want to pay for it anymore. Absolutely. It's a wonderful balance. And so trying to give you services and keep that cost at a level that is not unreasonable mm -hmm. uh, is always a challenge because there's only so much money to go around and you have to weigh what's the best thing to do with the dollars, okay? So Thank you would you. suggest for anybody who does want to have their voice heard to get on to- Get on the, the committee, committee. Okay. yeah. Uh, there are plenty of seats. Mm -hmm. Student government has seats, residence halls has seats, off-campus people have seats. Because it's not just the residence dining, we talk about what's going on in the Johnson Center. Mm -hmm. We talk about what's happening in the hub, mm -hmm. sub one. And we got Academic 7 coming. There's gonna be a restaurant in Academic 7. What mm -hmm. should it be? Who should I be looking for to take that spot? Okay. Well, with all that we've discussed today, um, on behalf of Ashley and I, and I'm sure our fellow students, we do appreciate you mm -hmm. um, speaking with us. Yes, absolutely. We're just curious, do you have any other final comments that no. you want uh, to uh, give to George Mason students? Students that live in, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, if the students are in residence, mm -hmm. get involved with the Resident Student Association and get selected to the Food Service Committee. Mm -hmm. It is important that we hear the voice. If they do not put somebody on the committee, student government will fill the slots mm -hmm. so that we have a full committee that will give us the information that we're mm -hmm. looking for. And, you know, it, it helps us do a better job. If we get a diverse 
body talking to us. And that's why this year we've got resident student seats specifically versus just all student government appointees. Okay? So yeah, we, we appreciate hearing from students, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it, because mm -hmm. there are times that we screw up. Mm -hmm. You know, we still have a couple cashiers that are saying, no, you must have your, do the iris scan or you can't eat. Mm -hmm. Well, we told them, no, we're encouraging that. Mm -hmm. And yet, and we have people that swear we're doing laser scans of retinas, and that's not true either. But it's a rumor. I talked to a father just a few minutes ago that swore that's what we were doing to his daughter. And he read the article that we have online. Mm -hmm. And he said that it's still a retina scan. I said, no, it's a photo of the iris. Mm -hmm. It's a little thing. But again, he gets off and comments. But what we're trying to do is balance the service and do it the best we can. Well, we certainly hope that you continue to listen to the student voice. Mm -hmm. uh, it definitely um, build on the relationship Mason students have with Mason Dining. So yeah, just thank you once again yes, for thank joining us. Yes, thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> nice meeting you. It's been very wonderful. Okay.